Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the message we received this morning uh, in that young man's heart. We thank you for our study in the uh, book of Genesis where it all begins. And pray that you find us busy about reading beyond Genesis where it continues up until the arrival of our blessed Savior. We talked a lot today about suffering and how it is part and parcel of the human condition. It comes with the territory. Thanks to our father, Adam, who is our federal head. And even amidst his failure is the grace of God. And maybe without our failures, it would be harder to see the grace of God. Now we ask as we go through this study this evening that you would help us watch what we say, that we treat the text with the respect that it deserves and that we are mostly accurate as we handle it as accurate as is humanly possible. Thank you for these dear souls. We commit this time to you in the name of your Son, our Savior. Amen. Okay, we are on chapter 45. This may well be the emotional highlight of the entire Old Testament. It's where Joseph reveals himself to those scoundrels he calls his brothers. Verse 1. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Now the servants retired a sufficient distance from their Lord and Master, but certainly not outside of earshot. They were out of sight, but most certainly not out of earshot, as a servant always is ready to hear the voice of his master. In this case, if Joseph had been in distress or needed something, he, he, he had to but speak, and his servants would be um, at his beck and call. As people who are not their own, but have been purchased with a price that is our responsibility as the servants of God to never be with outside the earshot of our master so that when he calls, we might respond, here I am. And we talked about that. It's a pretty, pretty straightforward process, three steps. Hear, respond, and obey. So... I say that to say this, verse 2, and he wept aloud. The Hebrew literally reads, he gave full voice to his weeping. This is a guy who's holding nothing back. He said 22 years away from his family. It goes on to say the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. I would imagine they did. All right, verse 3. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my Can you hear 11 chins hit chests right about now? <laughs> I am Joseph. Does my father, you see the change in the in the in the dialogue here. It's no longer your Father, it's my father. Does my father still live? But his brothers, <laughs> not surprisingly, could not answer him. For they were dismayed in his presence. They had, taught, they had taken, they had taken uh, precautions to cover up their crime. And now all of a sudden... I remember growing up, you know, if I did something wrong and I got through the day and my dad didn't didn't whoop me that day, I thought maybe I got away with it. 
<laughs> Three days later, oh, really? Well, this is 22 years. The statutes of limit, statute of limitations for sin do not run out. So now on a personal level, Joseph wants to know how his dad is. Is he still alive? After all, it's probably been a year since they ate up all the food and had to come back for more and, oh yeah, pick up Reuben, who's been cooling his heels in the dungeon. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, uh, it says they were dismayed by his presence. They have, figuratively speaking, received Joseph back from the dead. His brothers have come out of their darkness into God's glorious light, and they are terrified. It's hard to be born into this world without crying. How much more difficult is it to be born again without the tears that that freedom brings? And possibly the only event that will surpass the story of this chapter is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Those who crucified him will see him alive again. Uh-oh. They'll cry in anguish. They will prefer to be crushed by falling rocks than to face the light of God and Jesus' forgiveness. Revelation 6, verses 15 through 17, Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, every slave and every free man, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us away. Hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Now we have talked many times in the book of Revelation that the second advent of Jesus Christ is not him coming, Jesus meek and mild. It is not him coming in his humiliation as Philippians 2 puts it. But the book of Revelation tells us that when he returns, he will come to judge and make war. So this is not Jesus meek and mild, chapter 19. Now the brothers never quite came to grips with the forgiveness of their sins. This is clear from the words that they addressed to Joseph after Jacob's death, chapter 50. And we'll get to that. Verse 4, And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me which infers that they had been standing afar at a respectful distance. So they came near. Why? To identify him. Look into his eyes and see that this, is, this, this man, this king in their eyes, is the boy. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Well, here's the other shoe, right? <laughs> Verse 5, But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Another mystery that I have had a hard time understanding is the fact that God uses our sins to the advancement of his kingdom. Knowing this, it was easier for Joseph to say what he did. The human agency in this story was his brother selling him into slavery. The divine agency was accomplished through the human agency, and that God, in, in what God did in order to save lives and later to set up a place that he might segregate his people from the rest of the people and grow out of them a great nation. We'll get to chapter 50, verse 20, but I'll tell you now what it says. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. 
All of this activity, the, fee, the famine, the selling of Joseph, Joseph's time in the prison, his time in Potiphar's home, was all according to God's plan. So that, and bear with me, when he needed Joseph, he knew where to find him. And and some and sometimes that's the case with us. We are where we are. We are inhibited, we are handicapped, we are stalled sometimes, so that when God needs us, he knows where to find us. Now, that's a human perspective of a omnipresent God. All right? An omniscient God. Like in the garden where he says, where are you? Where are you? Like he didn't know? Well, of course he knew. But oftentimes God's questions to us are not for his benefit, they're for ours. And they are a they are, they are catalyst to another C word, which is confession. Where are you? I'm hiding from you. Why are you hiding? Because I've done wrong. Because I done wrong is the beginning of a con conversation. Because I done, done wrong is the beginning of restoration. If we confess. And in the Greek, it's less of an if and more of a when. When we confess, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. Okay, verse 6 says, For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. Now this is Joseph informing his brothers of what has passed and what will yet come, indicating you ain't seen nothing yet. You've made it through two years of this. There's five more to come. I imagine his brothers, if, if they did not ask him directly, might have thought, how do you know? And I would love to have been there when Joseph said, ah, oh, I had a dream. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 7, And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Now how bad are you feeling? <laughs> he does not have to prove to them that he has become a powerful person in the Egyptian government. They have already experienced the power that he has over them. Verse 8, so now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord over all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. All that Egypt controls, Jacob is head over. Joseph, thank you. I'm terrible with names. I blame, my, I blame my father, but I won't tell you why. Some of you already know. He called me everything but my name until I was about 13, so I didn't know who he was talking to. All right. Father to Pharaoh was a title given to the vizier of Egypt and referred especially to his advisory function. It's also possible that Joseph was actually older than Pharaoh. In addition, God made Joseph master of Pharaoh's house and ruler of all of Egypt. I can only imagine the terrible acts of retribution that might have been dancing through the heads of his brothers at this particular time. Talk about a guy who could have gotten even. Verse 9. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me and do not tarry. First Joseph tells his brothers to come in verse 4. Now he's telling them to go and he's telling them to be quick about it. Shuggity boogity, that's in the Hebrew. Shuggity boogity. Right. 
I would have loved to have heard the conversations around the campfires at night on, on the way back to Canaan. To, well, what are we going to tell Dad? We better tell him what Joseph told us to tell him. You want to eat, don't you? Sorry? Truthful? Oh, that would have been a change. All right, verse 10. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children, your children's children, your flocks and your herds and all that you have. The land of Goshen is also known as the land of Ramses. Include the cities of Python and Ramses, and maybe on where his wife's father was high priest, Heliopolis. Yeah. It's on the coast of Aqaba, so it did not re, re, require the flooding of the Nile. It got rain. And this was where, the, where God was going to make a nation out of them. He was going to sequester them from the rest of the world. Because they had, they had already proved that they could not do them themselves, do that themselves, because they were intermarrying with the Canaanites. So he separated them from the Canaanites and from the Egyptians and from everybody else. You shall be near me. Now this can be construed in many ways. Maybe so I can keep an eye on you. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it Joseph's checking in on his brothers that got him thrown into prison in the first place? Verse 11, there I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty. So there are still five years of famine. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. Your eyes and the eyes of Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. Now, we know in the Old Testament that a thing is established by a witness of two or more. And here Joseph sends 11 of them back to attest to the fact that he is, one, alive, and two, the master of all of Egypt. Verse 13, so you shall. And I did a lot of my grown-up years in the employ of the federal government, both in the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy. And when you heard the word shall, <laughs> I mean, you're going to do it, okay? There are consequences if you don't when you heard the word shall. Should? Well, that's a whole different story. You shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and all that you have seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. Oh, what a reunion that will be, huh? When we all see Jesus. Revelation 21, verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, neither shall there be any disease or pain, or most importantly, no curse we will finally be free of the flesh. What a day that will be. Verse 15, Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them, and after that his brothers talked with him. The fact that he is kissing his brothers is a sign, the first sign of reconciliation. Unless you're Judas Iscariot, it's kind of hard to Kiss somebody that you're not being reconciled to. And if you can, you may want to examine your heart. Okay? Verse 16, now the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brothers have come. So it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. It is evident that in spite of being alone in the room, the conversation between Joseph and his brothers has been heard and passed along. The fact that the dividing wall of hostility has been abolished between Joseph and his brothers is indicative of the wall of hostility that has been abolished between us 
and a holy God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Where once we were objects of wrath, Ephesians chapter 4, we are now brethren. And he is not ashamed, according to Hebrews, to call us such. That is amazing grace. That is beyond what we could ever hope or imagine. And that's the promise. Beyond what you can hope or imagine. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hope or imagine. Go ahead. Think about it. Think how nice it will be. Not to be fat or bald or lame or anything else. Beyond what you can hope or imagine. Imagine what it must be like to be free from the curse. To be free from the flesh. To be free from temptation. Go ahead, imagine it. Because all those promises are yes in Jesus Christ. Verse 16. Okay, we read that. Verse 17. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this. Load your animals and depart. Go to the land of Canaan. Bring your father and your households and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you will eat the fat of the land. Now you are commanded to do this. Take carts out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives. Bring your father and come. Also, do not be concerned about your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. So, word of Joseph's brother's arrival hits the ears of Pharaoh, and he sanctions what Joseph has intimated to his family in that Pharaoh also will give them the best, the very best of the land of Egypt. Pharaoh's provision for transport is preceded by his command. He was not giving them options, but was making his expectations known. He instructed them not to be concerned about their personal possessions because the goods of all the land of Egypt would be theirs. I see a similarity there in our transition from the land of Egypt, which is, yeah, to the land of heaven. You've heard the saying, right? I've never seen a U-Haul trailer on the back of a hearse. Yeah. Well, that's us. We are not going to be concerned about our worldly possessions. Where rust, ru moths and rust doth corrupt. It says every spiritual blessing. We have received every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says all the promises of God are in are yes in Jesus Christ. If he said it, the Son will make it so. Now all of this is coming out of the initiation of Pharaoh. This is Pharaoh's response. This is the high regard that he has for Joseph. Verse 21, then the sons of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh, and he gave them provisions for the journey. First thing we see here is the obedience of the sons of Israel. They did what they were told. Do you think at this point it ever crossed their minds not to be obedient? They were very readily accepting and obeying the orders of, of their little brother. Verse 22, he gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garments, which doesn't sound like anything to us, but back then that was a big deal. A change of garments was a big deal. It indicated wealth. Like, you know, in the 50s, you have two TVs in your house? 
So he gave to each man changes of garments, to, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. All right. So when I got to the five changes of garments, I didn't have much trouble with that, uh, understanding that five is the number of redemption. But 300 pieces of silver. Why? <laughs> Why 300 pieces of silver? Exodus 30, verses 12 through 15, reading from the King James. When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. When thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them when thou numberest them. This they shall give, every one that passes among them that are numbered, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. And half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. And it may not say that here, but this is silver. Shekel of silver. Silver throughout, the, throughout the, our study of the tabernacle is indicative of redemption. Everyone that passes among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering un, unto the Lord. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for their soul. Exodus 38, verses 25 and 26, And the silver of them that were numbered of the congregation was an hundred talents, a talent being approximately, depending on whose talent you use, 75 pounds. Okay? A becca for every man, that is a half a shekel, after the shekel of the sanctuary, to everyone that went to be numbered from 20 years old and upward. So I'm wondering, what do, what do we do with 300 shekels? Joseph sent 300 shekels of silver back with his brothers. So I got to investigating. It is provocative to think that Joseph may have sent silver back to Canaan to redeem the souls of his family in type of what would be played out during the Exodus some 430 years later. What is significant about 300 shekels? How much might be required to redeem an individual? What figure do you think Joseph might have used? 20. Genesis 37, 28 says that Joseph was sold for 20 shekels of silver. Like I said, provocative. Go ahead, divide that. Divide 300 by 20 and you get 15. So how many family members did Joseph send money back to redeem? 15. So who would the lucky 15 be? 11 brothers, Dad, Leah, Zilpah, and Bilhah. 15. Like I said, provocative. I'm not saying that's why 300. I'm just saying, hmm. Yeah, when I don't know the answer, that's my, that's my, hmm. <laughs> All right, that'll give you something to think about. And he sent to his father these things, ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, and ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father for the journey. Why not just send 20 donkeys? Because female donkeys were of much more value than male donkeys. They provided milk for the little ones, cheese, butter, all that stuff. So he sent his brothers away, and they departed, and he said to them, See that you do not become troubled along the way. And in our vernacular, it's mind your manners. I don't have to tell you. We, uh, <laughs> thank your lucky stars if you did not grow up in my house as one of my children. When my son would go on a date, 
I would say to him, now I don't have to tell you to behave yourself, do I? He go, no, sir. And I said, well, I'm glad I don't have to tell you to behave yourself. Because if I had to tell you to behave yourself, I'd tell you to behave yourself. But since I don't have to tell you to behave yourself, I won't bother telling you to behave yourself. So because I didn't have to tell him, he heard it about eight times. <laughs> All right. Okay, where are we? 25? Then they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob, their father. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still because he did not believe them. Verse 27. But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. So they arrive home, they tell Jacob the news. I don't know what they told him. I don't know how much they confessed. We lied, we knew he wasn't dead, we sold him. I don't know what they told their father. Or if those skeletons remained in the closet. I have an inkling based on these guys that jo that Jacob never heard the full story. That's just my inkling. I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. We should try to imagine the magnitude of Jacob's emotions. For about 15 years, he had lived with the tragedy of the loss of his son. And here Joseph was not dead. And all of a sudden he's told that not only is he not dead, he's alive and he's the man. Fifteen years is a long time to see your kid's picture on a milk carton, don't you think? Yeah. Verse 28, and Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. This guy is talking about death a lot. Well, his death didn't come until 17 years later. He lived in the land of Egypt, specifically in the land of Goshen, for 17 years, which is the age of Joseph when his brother sold him into the land of Egypt. Another one of those things that make you go, hmm. All right. Jacob never returned to Canaan except for a funeral. And that was his own. Chapter 45. That was chapter 45. Any questions? Didn't mean to confuse you. All right. Okay. 46. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. This is the last sacrifice he brings to God in the land of Canaan. And in fact, it is the last sacrifice we read of him giving at all. I'm not saying he didn't, but this is the last one that is penned in the Holy Writ. His father Isaac had died 10 years prior to this, but he chose that place. He chose it in remembrance of the communion which his father and grandfather had with God in that place. So now all three of them have communed with God in that place. And that may be the turning point or the, uh, the time when God was now known as the God of Abraham Isaac, and Jacob. Now, it says, what does it say? Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. This was customary for Jacob. I think this is the sixth appearance of God to Jacob. 
And he addressed him not only by his old name, but his new name, showing that both names were used interchangeably. And we see that among many of God's people. Paul and Saul and Peter and Simon. And we'll all get new names. All right, so the doubling of Jacob's name emphasizes God's call. And as was Jacob's custom, he answers, here I am. Doesn't necessarily have been obedient all those times he answered, here I am, but at least he's answering up. And as we talked about, that's our response. When the master calls, here I am. That's our job. That's what is expected of us. Those who desire to keep up communion with God shall find that it never fails on his side. If we speak to him as we ought, he will not feel, fail to speak to us. If there's a rift in the communication, as we all, I'm sure, are well aware, it is because we have moved, not him. And the pride that we as believers sometimes show when we assume through the truth of his word that he will always be there and we can come at our leisure. Verse 3, so he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. Why would Jacob have been afraid to go down to Egypt? This is the first time one of the patriarchs has gone to Egypt with God's permission. But why would he be afraid? Are you or are you not doing what you were told to do by God Almighty? Yes, I am. Why then would he be afraid? Well, in Genesis 15, 13, God told Abraham, I will make a great people out of you. And they will be captive and enslaved in a nation that is not their own for 400 years. Well, as long as you stay out of Egypt, you can't be enslaved, Right? But here your God's telling you to go to Egypt. So here he goes. So this upcoming trip to Egypt had divine sanction. God told Isaac, do not go. He told Jacob, do not go into Egypt. This, again, is the only time the family leaves with God's sanction. And Jacob had plenty to be afraid of. 430 years of slavery was just around the corner. And that, too, was God's plan to be enslaved. You'll, you will spend 430 years. 400 being round numbers in slavery to Egypt, and you will be mistreated. And I'll make a great nation of you there. Couldn't you make a great nation of us in Canaan? Why Egypt? I don't know that the I don't know that the Bible tells us why Egypt. I don't know. Why Egypt? Why not Canaan? Why not leave me alone where I am and make a great nation of me where I am? Why don't you do that instead? Why subject me to discomfort? Why subject me to suffering? Why continually kick me out of my comfort zone? Why do you do that? Because unless he does, we will think, 
that whatever it is that we accomplish came from us rather than him. I had a friend who was going through a terrible time. One thing after another got plucked away from them. And they finally came to the realization that God was removing every crutch in their life that they were leaning on beside the strong arm of their Savior. Well, that's why. In the land of Egypt, they had to depend on God. In our suffering, we have to depend on God. Without the suffering, I am fearful that we would forget him. But our suffering drives us to him. Not to mention the fact that in the book of Colossians, you know, where is Jesus now? That can be a hard question to answer in light of the omnipresence of the triune Godhead. But what is what is what does the book of Hebrews tell us is the location of our Savior right now today? And it's not in your heart. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. That's where he is. I have no idea where I was going with that either. I just know it was going to be profound. It'll 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 come to me. It'll come to me. Or maybe it won't. <laughs> so God promises to make a great nation of them. In Numbers 2, we have Numbers does not mean numbers, even though there are numbers in numbers. Clear? Yeah, good. <laughs> That's my Chuck Missler moment. <laughs> it literally means wandering, is what the book means. And through the translation of the Hebrew into Greek through the Septuagint, we get numbers. So there was a census in chapter 2, an approved census from God, go number the people. And they were numbering men, 20 years old and older, who were able to fight. So if you're under 20, you didn't count. I think it was 50. If you're older than 50, you didn't count. That might have just been the priesthood. I'm not real sure on that. But if you were blind, deaf, crippled, you did not count because you could not fight. The number in Numbers, chapter 2, is 603,550 fighting men. That was the size of Israel's army as they came out of Egypt, which might have put their population as high as 3 million people. They came into Acts, Acts 7, Peter's speaking to, speaking to the council, and he says 75 people. God started with 75 people. Now you'll see, you'll see totals, and you'll probably see one here in Genesis that speaks of 70. Well, here again, the Bible's wrong. There's a contradiction. No, it's a matter of who's counting and whom they're counting. So both numbers are correct based on who's counting and whom they're counting. So there were 70 people that came out of Canaan and if you include Joseph and Ephraim and Manasseh and, and grandsons, 75 is a very uh, reasonable and reachable number. 603,000 came out of Egypt 40 years later after God had killed them off with the exception of four. Four men 
that were counted in the first census is all that's left that came out of Egypt. And God took 40 years to kill them off for a couple of reasons. One, they were in the promised land for 40 days. And that cost them a year of wandering for every day they were in the promised land. And secondly, God did not kill them off immediately as to make them vulnerable to animals and other people groups. So he killed them off gradually. In Numbers 26, there's another census. And this census had the same criteria. And this census was designed to count the size of Israel's army when they crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land, 601,000. So this, this nation has been in stasis for 40 years. They have gone nowhere. They have not grown. They have not progressed. They have done nothing for 40 years except be prepared to follow God. Verse 4. So God was true to his word. He made a great nation out of a family. They went down to Egypt, a family, and they left a nation. Verse 4, I will go down, to, down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you at, back up again. And Joseph will put his hands on your eyes. He's talking to Jacob. He says, you go down, you live until you die, and your son will be there at your death to close your eyes. There's some comfort in that. This promise was given to the people of Israel so that throughout this 430 years of slavery and mistreatment, they as a family, they as a nation would have a promise of God to hang on to. Verse 5, Then Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob, their little ones and their wives in the carts which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. So they took here we are. Here we are, folks. So they took their livestock and their goods, which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and went to Egypt, Jacob and all his descendants with him. So the family ignores Pharaoh's advice to leave everything behind. They pack it all up. And they take it all with them. Sometimes the best thing we can do is sever ties. Sometimes the best thing we can do is leave the trappings of this world behind. Verse 7. His sons and his sons' sons, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. The use of the plural indicates that Dinah was not the only daughter that Jacob had. She just was famous or what happened in chapter 34 at Shechem. Okay. Um, can I get a volunteer to read verses 8 through 25? No? No, you won't. No, you won't. I, I, <laughs> I wouldn't subject you to that. These are no, nothing but names we can't pronounce. No, <laughs> like a lamb to the slaughter. <laughs> All right. Now these were the names of the children of Israel, Jacob and his sons who went to Egypt. Reuben was Jacob's firstborn. The sons of Reuben were Hanok, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. The sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jemin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shual, the son of a Canaanite woman. The sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Now those three play a significant role in the history of the nation of Israel. It was the Gershonites, and I could get the Gershonites and the Merarites confused, but one of them had responsibility relative to the tabernacle for all of the coverings. The other one had responsibility for all the pillars, posts, boards. 
and the Kohathites had responsibility for carrying the furniture, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the altar of incense, the table of showbread, the menorah, the brazen altar, and the laver. They had responsibility to hand carry those after Moses and or Aaron had gone in and covered them. They were not visible. Verse 12, the sons of Judah. Verse 13, Issachar, Zebulun, and on and on we go. All the way down to verse 20. And these names are important if you care to study them. Names and genealogies were very important to God because the land was part of the Abrahamic covenant. And in order to honor the Abrahamic covenant, we had to know who, to whom, the land was given. And we have to wait until the book of Joshua to figure that out. Verse 20, And to Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bore to him. Talks about the sons of Benjamin in verse 22. These were the sons of Rachel, who were born to Jacob, 14 persons in all. And on we go through verse 25. This is a photo album, if you like, of God's family. Why are these lists of names given to us in the scriptures? Doesn't God have more important information to give us? Well, here's, here's one guy's answer. He says, my friend, when he's really meaning, hey, doofus. There is nothing more important than our Lord Jesus Christ, and this is the genealogy that leads to him. If God thinks it's important enough, out of all that he knows, out of all that he's done, if you go to the last verse of the Gospel of John, the Apostle John says, Jesus did many more things than these, and I suppose if I wrote them all down, the world would not be able to contain the volumes of all the things that God knows, of all the things that God has done, he has chosen to write this down for you and me. My recommendation is read it. You may not read it with any hope of understanding, and because you're not Jewish, it may lose some of its importance. But do God the solid, will you, and read it? Verse 26, all the persons who went with Jacob to Egypt who came from his body besides Jacob's son's wives were 66 persons in all. 66, how do we get to 70? Jacob, Joseph, Ephraim, Manasseh is how we get to 70. How do we get to 75? Two sons each of Ephraim and Manasseh and a grandson. All right, and no, I'm not making that up. <clears throat> okay, so 66 is a subtotal. <laughs> okay, so I don't know what else to tell you about that. 27, and the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two persons. All the persons of the house of Jacob who went to Egypt were 70. There you go. And then Peter in Acts chapter 7 goes, well, there are 75 when you count them all. Okay. Verse 28, then he sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out before him the way to Goshen, and they came to the land of Goshen. 29, so Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel, and he presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while.
There's a difference between a chariot and a wagon. The chariot was not only more light, more lighter. <laughs> the chariot was not only lighter, it was more elegant in its construction than the former. It was drawn by horses, not oxen. It was a it was the limousine of that era. It was he, he, and this is not a prideful thing on Joseph's part. It was required of the office. Much like our president does not travel outside of Secret Service protection and a bulletproof limousine. It is what is required of the office. So that's how he showed up. Wept on his neck a good while. I imagine this to be a picture of our reunion with Christ one day when we see him face to face. There is no recorded word between these two while they are embracing and weeping. And I am sure we have all experienced that with friends, for example, who have lost loved ones when there's nothing to say except to hold them and cry with them. Verse 30. And Israel said to Joseph, now let me die since I have seen your face because you are... This guy goes on and on about dying. He's in a hurry to get to heaven, isn't he? <laughs> And Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face, because you are still alive. Literally, now I can die a happy man. And in our case, it's, we don't see his face, and then let me die. We die, and then we get to see his face. So it's a little different. I was telling somebody this morning, I'm, afraid, I'm not afraid to die. I used, I used to ride a motorcycle to the Bay Area every day. So, you know, come and get me. It's not, it's not death that worries me personally. It's how am I going to get there? You know, we all want to go quickly in our sleep, don't we? Yeah. Verse 31, Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, My brother... My brothers and those of my father's house who were in the land of Canaan have come to me, and the men are shepherds, for their occupation has been to feed livestock, and they have brought their flocks, their herds, and all that they have. So it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation, that you shall say, here's, not, here's that shall again, your servant's occupation has been with livestock from our youth, even till now, both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. One of the reasons, I believe, is that Pharaoh, more than likely at this period of time, is not actually an Egyptian. He is a Hyksos. And Hyksos ruled Egypt for 170 years. And this may have been the last pharaoh of the Hyksos. And the Hyksos were a Semitic people, as were the Jews, which might explain the benefits, some of the benefits that Joseph and his family enjoyed as Semitic people from a Semitic pharaoh. The fact that they were shepherds would not have shocked the Hyksos Pharaoh, but they certainly were an abomination to the people that he ruled. So this was kind of an insurance policy, I, as I see it, to ensure that Pharaoh would separate this Semitic people from possibly his own. It's impossible to determine from our distant perspective what the actual basis for this feeling of abomination was. There were probably religious as well as political reasons. We know that there was a pantheon of gods worshipped 
by the Egyptians, some of which were cattle. And we see that in the vision that Pharaoh had of the lean cattle and the fat cattle as sacred beings coming out of the Nile, which was a sacred being. You know, there's not a food shortage in India. They got cat. They got they got Big Macs running around the city. It's a pro. It's a, it's it's a problem with their religion. It's a problem with who they worship. And this may have been a similar case here. The religious ones could be that divine qualities were attributed to cattle. I don't get it. So sacrificing cattle or eating beef would have been a sacrilege. The fact that the Israelites in the desert made a golden calf might point to this as well. And it's odd in that most commentators I read believe that the golden calf was not necessarily the image of a foreign god. It was their image of the god Yahweh who saved them. Matters not to the God Yahweh, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt make no graven image. And so when somebody asks you what comes to mind, what picture comes to mind when people say to you, God? The answer should be nothing. If he's a spirit, he must be worshipped in spirit and truth. You want to talk about his son? We can talk about his son. It's interesting that the word of God has much to say about shepherds. Shepherd is a figure of speech which is used to describe the Lord Jesus Christ. He calls himself the shepherd. And he is still an abomination to the world today, isn't he? What Joseph sought to do was build a case for Pharaoh's allowing the Hebrews to settle in Goshen. The separation would reduce friction with Egyptians and preserve their distinctiveness as a people. Moreover, settlement of the Hebrews in the eastern delta would make it easier for them to leave when that time came. We see that time in very few chapters ahead of us, approximately 17 years from now or thereabouts during the Exodus, right? Some things don't change, folks. We were speaking just this afternoon about the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New Testament. The same God. The same God. Well, God is love. Well, that is absolutely true. But the book of Hebrews in the New Testament says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. The book of Psalms says that God swears by his holiness and he swears by his wrath. In the New Testament, when the Lord Jesus comes by, comes back, it will be the wrath of the Lamb, not the wrath of the Father that men will fear. He required then that his people be separate. Remember when he says, come out from among them? Who's the them? The unbelievers. Come out from among them. The book of Hebrews says, you have been made holy. A synonym for that word is sanctified. By definition, it is set apart for a specific purpose. If a priest's son wanted to go build a sandcastle, he was not to use the spoon out of the tabernacle because it was holy. How can an inanimate object be holy? Because it it, we misdefine the word. It is because it has been set apart for a specific purpose. And had the priest kid gotten a hold of it and used it for an improper pur purpose, 
Did it become unholy? No. It had to be cleansed in order to be used in its designated function. This speaks to you and me, doesn't it? We have been set apart. We have been made holy. That is our position. We have been set apart. And the rest of the New Testament talks to us about how to behave as people who have been set apart. Yeah. And that's the hard part. And that's the definite that because we carry we live we live in a fallen body with a fallen heart and a fallen mind. We fight the flesh. We're constantly interpreting, right, William? We're constantly interpreting our original language, which is lies, into the language we speak now as children of God, which is the truth. And there's always that process of going on. Because it is not natural. It's not natural for us to speak the truth. But as holy people, we're not working to become holy. We have been made holy. As all of the implements in the tabernacle and temple were made holy by the sprinkling of the blood of an acceptable sacrifice and a declaration by God Almighty, holy. That's you and me. Through the sprinkling of the blood of an acceptable sacrifice at the cross of Calvary, God has declared us holy. We are a holy people. Now, if only we could behave that way. That's a challenge. But God has given us everything. The book says God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. The book says we have the mind of Christ. I'm not speaking to you. I'm speaking to me. We all are just listening in. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you kindly for the day. We thank you for the lessons in the Old Testament and how they all and always point to Jesus the Christ. He is the Messiah, he is the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. And it is beyond me why God would use a vessel of clay for eternal things. God sees fit to use his obstinate, recalcitrant, creation called man whose only thoughts are always evil continually to go about the business of saving lives. What an honor. What a privilege. And we pray through the power of the Holy Spirit that you find us up to the task. We come to you and we give thanks to you and we glorify you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, thanks. I hope to see you next week.